Welcome to your favorite comics channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskler. And I'm Tom Scholey, author of I Am Stan. want to remind everybody of Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July, the last Saturday in July, July 29th. We are inviting our audience to join us in putting their doubles, their comps, just some good comics in their little local lending libraries. We want to make some new comic book readers, and we think that's a great place to meet readers and meet them with some good comics. This is the second year in a row that we are doing the Cartoonist Kayfabe comic book Christmas in July. Had a great response last year, probably a thousand social media posts. Let's go for 10,000 this year and let's make some new comic book readers. I also want to remind everybody that we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon now. Three different levels will give you access to the videos early, get you ahead of the Cartoonist Kayfabe effect. And at the highest level, the King Kayfaber level, you actually get to sit in on our recording sessions, which can be very handy for us whenever we cover books like we're doing today, and we can use that brain trust. So without further ado, Superman, All-Star Superman, issues 7 through 12. This is a 12-issue series that Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely created. Uh, one of the best Superman stories I can think of, mm -hmm. and I am super excited to dive into this with both of you. I can't, I can't think of... A second best. <laughs> well, it's it's all the Alan Moore stuff that this is building off of. It's that's building true. on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, okay. yeah, you're right, and that and that's true. That is the good stuff, and uh, it, it in a lot of ways it makes sense. Like you have the, the the British dudes who have this removed point of view of this Boy Scout character that's existed for so long that uh, we can't seem to figure out a way to make work. You know, <laughs> like the regular job or comics just just were not able to handle you know the requirements and grant morrison frank whiteley bless their freaking hearts they made a good superman comic yeah and and we're gonna go through it starting with this cover as we see bizarro cross-eyed you see his his mm -hmm. whatever this is ice vision i guess is a uh, bizarro instead of the heat vision but you can see it xing on that cover <laughs> because of those crossed eyes and you know there's a lot i like about this series besides the stories i love the color Mm -hmm. They do some interesting stuff with that, and we will kind of point those out, incidents of that, as we go along. I think it's very important, too, like, to the way that uh, Quitely chose to draw the thing with very, very kind of open lines, very precise lines. Uh, I don't think that it's inked. It, look, uh, it looks yeah, like I see pencil fibers. I think this is one of his first it sort is. of like straight and it's, um You see, even on the cover, Jamie Grant gets some credit You know, with Jamie Grant, the colorist, and also credited as digital inker, which I think that kind of title has somewhat gone away over the years, but they weren't sure how to how to present that. Because yeah. cause, uh, all you got to do is have yeah. enough people out there and know Photoshop and know that, oh, mo that motherfucker just bumped up some levels. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you slide a bar. Yeah. <laughs> so... This is the only real two-parter in this series, the the Bizarro World crossover, and I kind of got annoyed reading this one. I hate the Bizarro speech pattern. Interesting. Like, I'm reading that in my head and getting mad. Because for some people, this is, like, a standout issue. Like, when it was coming out in real time, it's like, this is, like, another step up. This is, you know... It's the kind of thing that Morrison does, like, what, like when he brings Batmite into Batman mm -hmm. universe and it's like, well, the fifth dimension is imagination and this is where I exist. Like he's, he's trying to think that, that kind of stuff through and it's tough. Um, I recently went down the ra a rabbit hole. Like I got uh, J Jim Shooter's bibliography of DC comics. So I read like this action comic where he does a Supergirl story and it's, it's uh, his first issue of comics when he's a kid. And I accidentally read this Superman feature ahead of it. There are, in that one, there are two Supermen. There is one in the year 2000-something, one in the year 3000-something, just having their own independent adventures with all adjacent characters. It is ridiculous. <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it'll show, like, the mo a modern-day Superman on the cover with, like, suit tie and, like, cars that you understand. But neither story had anything to do. Right. It was stupid. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of subtlety in this artwork, too. Yeah. I was looking on this page. You see the Bizarro world mm -hmm. just starting to sneak in in the form of a square shadow that it's casting. Turn the page, the big reveal. Maybe not reveal, but the payoff of that little tiny square shadow, which you still continue to see. This comic is full of that, which is part of the reading experience. It's just... It makes me wonder about script, yeah. what Morrison's providing to Quitely in terms of detail, because some of this stuff, the subtlety... 
it's hard to believe it's coming from two people yeah. because it just works very well together. There's a lot of heavy lifting in the visuals, and it's got to be accomplished through a very close collaboration, in my opinion. But when, when we when we talk to Quitely, it's like it's two guys in the same room a lot of the time. Like they're you know they're able to hang out and hash this stuff out. So M- Morrison's a very visual thinker. Like after reading this, I I went down the YouTube rabbit hole of uh, listening to like a four and a half hour set of conversations he had with Kevin Smith. And when he's talking about like the comics that he's into and the stuff that he likes, he's not talking about dialogue driven stuff. Like when you hang out with a lot of writers, they scan comics differently than you or I. Like they're looking at word balloons right. and shit. Uh, he's very visually oriented, and he is an artist. Yeah, he's yeah he's a a failed artist, quote unquote, <laughs> a frustrated artist. His art style is like a Jim Starlin ripoff. So which is really cool, but you know, good luck having a career being like a Jim Starlin ripoff in in you know the twenty twenties. So, start off at a holiday party at the Daily Planet, and bizarros are invading Earth. Mm -hmm. And this is another set of remarkable visual storytelling, because each of these characters, they're doing some business in that room, and you can track them. Mm -hmm. And you could also, with these various camera angles, you could play, they're, they're clearly placed in that room in exact spots. You know, they have marks to hit. Yeah. I think it's one of quietly strengths is yeah. that 3D mm-hmm. space thing. But, you know, going through this page, what I see is square, 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 mm-hmm. square, 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 square. You know, we have this square world invading the storyline. And I don't yeah. think that's lost in the script. Yeah, thematically reinforced. It reminds me of Alan Moore in that way, where mm-hmm. it's like we are visually going to represent this theme, this idea. It's going to be consistent in every mm-hmm. aspect of the story. And it's hard not to see the squares in this in this two-parter. Got to build in that big butch guy for for uh, storytelling purposes in the future. Yeah, and Steve Lombard. I couldn't tell from the panel, but he takes credit for throwing this bizarro infected party goer out the window. And I think that they just jump, but he is so um, hyperbolic of a guy. You know, he's such a butch guy that that he he's narcissistic. He like is inserting himself into. It. He's like, oh, I did that. Yeah. Touches a Bizarro and he's not affected by it, so mm-hmm. we're going to find out why <laughs> <laughs> as the uh, as the story unfolds. But others are, and it's really starting to take over. You know, we're looking at a big problem now. I hate Jimmy Olsen's hair. I mean, he draws it super well, and and I hate it only because I know guys that that had that at a time period, and you only want to like kick him in the jaw. Yeah, I was going to say because like yeah, that that hair. I felt like he did a really great job of updating Jimmy Olsen, who's a character that really should just be left in the fifties. He gave him like a little a little extra you know legs. All right, so a meteor crashes to Earth. Appears to be Superman, actually Bizarro, and now we've got a little kid in the crosshairs. Which, pretty good use by Morrison of, get some stakes in there, mm-hmm. right? Have an innocent at risk. And that's what you have to do with Superman, because uh, there's just kryptonite, you know? So you gotta bring the human element to it. And I think this is one of those first examples that I was talking about, the color that I like. Yeah. The primary colors of Superman throughout this comic, it's so bright, and you see the browns and the grays and the muted colors throughout this comic. Very contemporary color palette in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. Except when you see Superman and it is just bright. Looks great on the screen. It does. Looks great on the page. It's the kind of thing that I wish one of the superhero movies would figure out. I know, Because so many of the costumes, the answer is make them leather and dull. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I don't love a lot of superhero stuff. I like the costumes. Mm -hmm. I wish that that was a bigger part of translating that to other media. Because to me, that's kind of the fun part. So, Jimmy Olsen and company trying to escape off of the roof. And uh, Superman hopefully going to try to figure out this problem with the Bizarros. All the dirigibles, another like Alan Moore callback to like Watchmen. It also gives it a different time feel. Yeah. You know, it's like this story exists out of time. And that's one of those challenges, I think, with a character like Superman who talk about a guy out of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and when Morrison is playing with these with these icons, he likes to get as much of that of, of their lore and mythology into the story as possible. So like. So much of it is so goofy mm-hmm. that if you commit to a time, uh, we're just too cynical. The the elevator pitch was like, we had Crisis on Infinite Earths. What if that never happened and that goofy Superman we've had since the 1930s just continued into the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s? And that's sort of, I mean, it doesn't, like, the Bizarro origin is, a. this is like the first time we're seeing Bizarro. So it doesn't, he kind of abandoned that, but that's kind of the basic gist of it. Have all this goofy stuff that's gone through all those changes in comics with us. Yeah, that's kind of a great update because it 
could be nightmarish, mm-hmm. you know, in a contemporary setting as opposed to whenever comics were a little more for kids. Quietly's ability to just see things in a kind of a 3D and, mm-hmm. and choose yeah. all the perfect shapes, you can't, you can't sort of diminish that. That that is a very hard thing to mm-hmm. do, especially not hiding uh, with a bunch of shading and bl- and black and stuff. Uh, that's so simple to fuck up. It's something I'd be curious to talk to Quietly about because we've talked to Darrow about the why it's important to understand that three dimensional how things are put together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But a lot of artists don't bring that to a page, and it it makes for world building. I think um, this is kind of a great piece. The Bizarros are susceptible to yellow sunlight, so they have to attack the night side of the planet. Mm-hmm. And they note it's 9.30. <laughs> we're in trouble because mm-hmm. we're getting overrun already, and we've got most of the night ahead of us. Yeah, and you think about the movies that are coming out around Plus this time. Plus winter. These are, these are like, you know, the zombie movies, the, you know, 30 20, days 28 of... 28 days 28 days, yeah, and, and the 30 days of night and all that kind of thing. Visual payoff of our blimp here as we see the square Bizarro world behind a round blimp to really contrast and, and emphasize how... That bizarre world is strange compared to our world. Yeah, you know what's interesting? I sort of miss that. I mean, I see it there, and I was just like, what, what is that? Uh, because the way that it's fuzzed out uh, makes it look like a hologram or something. Mm-hmm. I think that's that early digital coloring and trying to figure this stuff out where you've got that's your outlines. and uh, yeah, You know, it, it, it's a challenge. It's interesting to see how people have tried to adapt to coloring and we're going to do another video on, a, on an interview from the early 80s that talk about once you get to this better paper the coloring and the ink changes. And I think it's taken decades to try to figure that out. And it still hasn't been codified. They, they did a lot of reworking of the color and they had like wizard previews of this where the color is like pretty different. And, and even like Frank talked about it, that like the colorist was making it way too bright for his tastes. Mm-hmm. And he was telling him to kind of like rein it in a little. So it, it is all this fine tuning that you don't even think of with comics. One of the things I see Morrison credited with a lot is ideas right yeah and it's part of what makes this series work for me you know rereading this i probably read this three or four times at this point there's always more stuff to notice and i love this that you've got another world coming in what's that going to do it's going to wreck your tides and everything Mm -hmm. it's it's a whole new gravitational pull and you see just kind of in a throwaway panel this could have been a two-page spread Mm -hmm. of like the wrecking havoc on the oceans and how that's affecting the coastal cities we get one panel because there's a lot going on i also love the superman lois lane story throughout this yes this is, um, we talked off camera about how this could have been marketed as another Death of Superman story. It's essentially what this 12 issues, you know, it's, it's running throughout the 12 issues is that Superman's been compromised early on when he was exposed mm-hmm. to too much sunlight. And so it's a countdown to his inevitable death. I think that one of the things the first Death of Superman misses, besides the visuals, there's no emotional, I don't feel anything whenever <laughs> Superman dies. They do a good job of trying to show some of that emotional ties, especially through Lois Lane's character. Totally. So that you build towards that. Like there is there are some stakes here. Yeah, and it's the it's the essential part because Superman is is not human. So also like like any guys, like he's emotionally trying to figure out how to handle this situation best, but kind of gets it wrong by holding her at a distance with what what's going on with him and it feels like another one of those subtle it's not front and center mm-hmm. yeah it's it's you know a subplot within this like it's another one of those subtle ideas that it works for me but it's not we're not beaten over the head with it uh what are you gonna do man superman's gotta kind of like punch this this planet out of range mm-hmm. like get it away from earth and that's what we're seeing here with this impact there are a lot of visuals necessary in this comic they don't always land but it's that idea of like, let's try to make Superman show the grandeur of what this character can be. Mm-hmm. So punching a planet out of orbit, essentially, is what we're doing on this page. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the little added bonus of it's angling that flat side, so reflecting some sunlight from the other side of the world right into these you know, sun-phobic uh, creatures. Yeah, and one of the great details, I believe Jimmy Olsen suggests that earlier in the book of this idea of like a big solar mirror that we could get the sunlight to hit. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of what you, what you have there. Pretty good for setup and payoff. These title pages. Title at the end kind of stuff. Yeah. Title at the end, title at the middle stylized. So it's always a consistent title. Mm -hmm. Even that feels like a very conscious decision on their part. And I don't see the credit here, but I believe Chip Kidd is your cover designer. I don't think Mm -hmm. he's doing the titles. But the cover uh, logo, I believe, is his. He fucking hates it. <laughs> it makes him so mad. He, in his lectures and stuff, 
shows off like his original ideas and what the stuff becomes and is like there's no DC cannot help themselves like these comic publishers cannot help themselves so he he did it his name's on it but that is not his first choice of of logo design it's uh, really interesting because at this point his name's off of it and I wonder <laughs> if he didn't say you know what guys yeah. you can just have that logo at this point <laughs> yeah shouts to shouts to Phil Bo- Ballsman man fellow fellow QB uh let, let her in uh let her in the strip he was one year ahead of me nice he he also designed that um Akira box set oh, nice. oh wow wow yeah. that'd be a fun yeah. I assume that'd be a fun project what to a work on yeah certainly a fun one to to have all right so superman successful in saving the earth but as uh, Lois Lane points out, what happened to Superman? Mm-hmm. Because Bizarro World's gone. Superman gone with it. And here we are, up, up, and away, but not quite. No. This world is drifting back into the underworld, another Morrison idea uh, of like a, a world under our universe. And that's where this cube world is descending into. There's a red sun. Superman has no powers, or at least fading powers, and will eventually die here. So part of what disappoints me in this two-part story is, did anybody does anybody believe Superman's not getting out of here? Like, yeah, if that's your big cliffhanger, I think that's that's a weak cliffhanger. Well, yeah, I, I mean, but then there's the intro of this new character Zabaro in the last page. So. And and a lot of like with with Superman, I think the concerns are different are different because because we know it right, like we know that that's not going to be a deal. So it becomes more an idea of like how Mm -hmm. because when you get to that point you don't know like like it's a question so uh morrison is setting himself up with a challenge because he is dangling that little hook and uh we don't know how he's going to get out of it so it has to be interesting enough for you to feel something good about it after at the end of this issue another morrison idea is zabaro's character being like on a planet of bizarros you're gonna have these genetic exceptions Mm -hmm. it's just it's just evolution like there's there's a mutation that creates evolution so you know one in one billion you know if like one in one billion people have like uh you know 10 toes or something like or you know like 10 toes on one foot or some shit like there's going to be one guy who isn't with the program And, and this world is a mirror held up to superman it's a mirror held up to dc comics and what the mirror is saying is that you're stupid you make no sense you're ridiculous, and you're doomed. This episode is brought to you by the cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. Three different levels of participation at our Patreon, but if you become a King Kayfaber, you get all of the videos before anybody else gets to see them, uh, and it mitigates the Kayfabe effect. You get first dibs on the things that we talk about, plus uh, you have access to the live stream recording sessions where we record a week's worth of videos, giving you even uh, more exclusive access uh, before anybody else. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make, and we have a big year in 2023. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming to you in time for the holiday season. 504 pages of comics in here, uh, that which represents the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree, plus uh, 140 pages of comics and material that are not in those first four volumes of Hip Hop family tree x-men grand design trilogy collects all of my x-men grand design work in one handy dandy trade paperback some of that is out of print at the moment the current focus is red room crypto killers issue number three is forthcoming and is going to be a hot key because it is establishing a version of the characters that i'm exploring in my daily comic strip which will be serializing on my patreon to start uh, at, a link, at the link in the description below. Jimmy has a nice plethora of materials out there. The Street Angel Princess of Poverty book is coming to you in November, in time for the holidays. Uh, it represents all of uh, Jim's Street Angel comics. If you have the Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive as a companion piece, Hulk Grand Design is the Marvel comic that Jim put together, but the newest effort uh, that is currently out of print but going to be getting uh, another print run is True Crime Funnies, and uh, make sure you connect with Jim at his website for that. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. And we have a bizarro Jarrell here. I mention that because another theme we're going to see is as Superman dies or gets closer to death, talking to his father... We're going to see other descendants from Krypton. So the themes are played out pretty pretty well. You know, I feel like if you were studying this from a writer's standpoint, 
you could have courses on this mm -hmm. on yeah. this series yeah, because it is very tight. Well, Quietly's mm -hmm. backgrounds are exquisite. We passed one up on that previous page on that last panel. That's just a sight to behold. Printed very dark on yours. I was going to say, like, I, yeah, I it's been, a little lighter on that. You know, um, yeah, yeah. You know what? You should show. You should show that. What's interesting too, Ed? Like, I, I see that you're reading this on an iPad, which makes a big difference. Wow, man, it makes me wonder if we should be using your edition. I, th um, I think I think you should because there, there was other stuff that was very very dark in your issues. Let's switch. You can okay. follow along in the comics. So if you notice anything different or noteworthy. You know, my favorite's always the ads. So yeah. if something pops out to you, uh, you know, just follow along that way. Um, but this is what happens, too, in collections. Because so much of this stuff prints, and then you see it. It's all colored on a monitor. Mm -hmm. You know, when I mentioned that you're reading it on a screen, like, I've read a lot of comics that way, where it's, like, in print, I'm disappointed in them. And I see them backlit, and it's like, oh, yeah, that looks amazing now. So it's a shame that it doesn't work in every media, but you can see, like, you correct it a little bit mm -hmm. whenever you get to this stage. And that's that digital coloring that I mentioned at the top of the show. This is a comic, when it came out, it made me change the way I think about comics. I mean, you know, one of the things being, you know, drawing in pencil. But another thing is just when you talk about the subtlety, when we learned about comics, it was like you avoid subtlety at all cost because it's just going to go over everybody's head. Nobody's going to see it. But it's like newer printing processes, newer reproduction. Um, you can put tiny details. And then the way you frame things, give give the reader hints to kind of pay attention at certain places. And I think that framing, some of that is, lots of ways that's accomplished. But one of them is Quietly's drawing. Ed, you pointed out that great background. And now we get into this project, I don't know, satellite or base, whatever it is. And you see almost no backgrounds, even though there's a little bit. You know, they're not completely devoid, but it allows an emphasis to be put on your characters as opposed to, Oh, let's look at this interesting laboratory that they're standing in. I don't know Superman history. Mm -hmm. Is Mr. Quentin Quintum? Is that Leo? Uh, a Leo, big character? Leo Quintum is a new character. He's sort of based on a couple, like you know, archetypes. Some of them Kirby, and then there's like the there's the fan theory that this is actually uh, Lex Luthor traveled back in time and it reformed as a result of some things happened later in the thing. But no, he's a, he's he's a new invention. Uh, Marson wanted to make sort of like a light ray, like Jack Kirby's light ray, this sort of, um, you know, god of, of the sun sort of thing. He has Roy G. Biv. Mm -hmm. I love outfit. the color. Yeah, it's yeah. very... Uh, like iridescent. Yeah, it's like very you know. different. Almost taking advantage of like, we've got digital coloring. What can we do with that? Yeah, and that could go wrong so easy. Oh, it but, could. but uh, you know, like, I guess Jamie Rich is like really understanding the folds of the clothes and stuff. And it looks, it's like a pearl shape or something. Like that kind of like, mm -hmm. you see the rainbow and like an oil slick hue. Mm -hmm. It's it's a neat character. I like that character. I'm surprised that that's a new character because it feels like it fits perfectly in the Superman mythos. Mm -hmm. Which surprises me that we don't have that character. Well, that, that project that he heads up is supposed to be like the DNA pro the Jack Kirby's DNA project. So it's, you know, continuation of those ideas, but yeah, completely great new to fool character. that in. Mm -hmm. All right. Back on Bizarro world, Superman now is, is speaking Bizarro in an effort to try to get these, these degenerates mm -hmm. to help him uh, build a ship before he just completely dies from lack of exposure to the yellow sun. You see crude drawings that he's trying to explain to them. And it is sort of like a, an Alice in Wonderland kind of story where he's in just this, like, through the looking glass, this world of madness, and he's trying to figure out their logic. It's and kitchen, yeah. That's, that's where a lot of the fun comes in, where he's saying, like, how annoying, like, the, the bizarre speech pattern is. It's like, he's trying to crack this code, and then it's that thing of, like, okay, what's the opposite of goodbye? Is it bad by? Is it bad high? Like, <laughs> what's, you know, like... You know, it's what opposite day. Like, yeah. like, 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 you know, kids play opposite mm -hmm. day. And how far are we going to push this? <laughs> right. You also see the weaknesses in Superman as he's like sweating and stuff like that. That stuff, I think, is a, a pretty good payoff. Whiteley does great with that because almost every panel, there's every subsequent panel, there's some little bit that kind of makes him weaker and weaker and weaker. The, the salesmanship of that is visually perfect, pitch perfect. And he gets this, uh, you know, spoof of the, the JLA. It's almost like, like a Mad Magazine or, or, you know, Inferior 5 kind of thing. One of the, uh, here's a pretty big color difference, you know, talking about the JLA characters. You're going to get a lot. I'm you know, you, you can see like Whoa. almost recoloring that first panel. And I, I feel like the toning things down is coming from Quietly. You know, so turning a bright green Green Lantern into a, a sort of like yellowish orange green lantern. Yeah, sickly like uh, pea yeah. soup green mm -hmm. lantern. 
He also does different stuff to show Superman fading. Like here we've got yeah. bags under his exactly. eyes. Exactly. Subtle but effective pieces. And um, like you said, you don't know Superman history. Frank Quitely doesn't either. Like he doesn't know any of this superhero shit, which is why, again, like he's able to bring this outsider perspective, see things through like an original lens. The tr tragic figure, this uh, Zabaro character, because uh, he he does have adequate intel intelligence and, mm -hmm. and he gets along just fine, but he's he's stuck with a bunch of people that he cannot in any way relate to. And and uh, I remember Geraldo Rivera when he went to Willowbrook, like which was like you know I guess in a, they call it an asylum at the time, some sort of like you know a lot of like handicapped people. What do you, I don't even know what the developmentally disabled people were there. Like one of the people that he met that he would bring out for anniversaries was a perfectly sensible intelligence person. He had a palsy and couldn't talk so well. And basically he's like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. I want to learn to read. I want to do the, like, like all this. He was, he was a regular dude, but because he had a palsy, he got warehoused in his facility with people like literally shitting all over the place in front of him and stuff. That's wow. Zabaro to me. Yeah, you know, the, the Zabaro character too, that's me, the reader. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. as this story unfolds and Superman is, is finding a way to get out of here, Zabaro is left behind. Right. Yeah. And like this whole two-parter, by the end of it, I'm so frustrated with the Bizarro mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and feeling bad reading it. Like it just doesn't even, I can't even read it and understand it. Very easy to identify of uh, what, what Zabaro is dealing Zabaro with. Zabaro is a fan favorite character, and I can see comics fans relating to him. I'm surrounded by idiots! Yes. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> but you see it too, like they hate him. Mm -hmm. It's not just that he can't connect, like they want him to leave. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a, a square peg. And I love the construction of this little ship that looks so janky. Yeah, it feels like an idea more mm -hmm. than a ship, which kind of makes sense with this whole story. And you see Superman tied down to it so weak, like his last chance, uh, you know, kind of identified in the lettering style mm -hmm. of like, he is just fading. Like, this is about the end. Yeah, and we're, we're reenact... Crimson mask on Superman's face as it's yeah, streaming, yeah, yeah. streaming down his face. We're reenacting his origin in reverse. Right. And yeah, he taunts he taunts the the super powered Bizarro into uh, lighting the the fuse. Right. Us do opposite. The pagination is very different between the comic books in here too. Yeah, makes you wonder like how important that is, if at all. What a bold choice for green as a background. You know, this bright, bright, bright green. Well, you know the red the red uh -huh. light right the the yeah. thing that's killing Superman on Bizarro world almost makes you sick reading it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a dark color. Red is black when you're reproducing things because it just absorbs the light. And so like you read this issue and, and you really, red is an oppressive color within this context. So yeah, whenever we want to go somewhere else, put green on the page. In a way he's in hell. Yeah. 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 Well said. And they're touching grass. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see their model, the universe this mm -hmm. is the under the underverse where everything gets very and heavy and squishes together. Basically, that's the end of the bizarro world. So now what? Lois Lane put through the ringer time and time again. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's <laughs> our issue number nine, and you can see how they're reproducing the covers in this as just episode nine. Clearly, it's one big story that yeah. they're telling here. Is this last page in the comic book? It is. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's the final page. And so, again, we're continuing Superman's origin, you know, crashing. And Superman's origin as a circus strongman, you know, the, the, the iconography of the circus strongman being part of, of Superman. Absolutely. I'm worried about this circus. I, I don't see a lot of community <laughs> around here. Who's going to come to the circus once they get their tent up? All the flying panels I enjoy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of foreshortening throughout here that I think is pretty inventive. That's an interesting choice, it too, is. putting him right on the horizon. Like, yeah. your instincts you would never that. let you do that. Yeah, but it looks so right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And what does Superman return to? Metropolis has been rebuilt with Krypton architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been colonized by other Kryptonians. And um, uh, Morrison says that 
these are Scottish Kryptonians, that he wanted to make Kryptonians modeled after some of the people he grew up with. And so that informs some of their characterization. And then Bar L is, I guess, like some, you know, region or maybe like a town or something, you know. But this would be like, you know, if we had like Pittsburgh, like Yins or Superman or something show up in, in, in our Superman comics. This is a strange color choice to me. I see a lot of uh, volcano videos online and stuff. None of them are yellow like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always that red magma and then yeah. cooling into like black liquid rock. But so. they're yellow. So it's, you know, that's Fair the enough. important bit. I do like the concept that they bore tunnels through this volcano so that it'll end up collapsing in on itself. That's kind of a clever physical visual. And it's interesting that they are performing super heroic deeds, even though as the story unfolds, not superheroes in the Superman tradition. Well, because Earth is their property and they're just being, being good landlords, you know, taking good care of it. It's their investment. And as they meet here, Pretty critical of Superman's dad. Mm -hmm. It is not the reunion that Superman would hope for. These are legendary Kryptonian astronauts mm -hmm. that would have, you know, been lost in space before Krypton explodes. So Superman's aware of who they are when he meets them, and they are of a very different disposition. As you say, uh, I yes. guess owners of, the, of this new planet that they have. Yeah, found. like, I mean, they're, you know, he's a, uh, Barrel is a barrel chested, burly, manly man, and Jorel, Superman's father, is a geek. You know, a twerp, a scientist. Go to the Fortress of Solitude. They have uh, colonized that for their own purposes. You see some of the remnants of that, some of Superman's robot army that has not fared as well against these these new guests. You just left your key laying around. Of course we're just going <laughs> to hang out and use it. They think this is atrocious, <laughs> the city of Candor. And it, it's one of those things, man, that Morrison is good at, like looking at things in a different way. Like, dude, you got an ant farm... Of our people, yeah, critiquing the Superman, the whole Superman thing. Yeah, you know? and 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 at this point, you still haven't figured out a way to 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 get them out of there. But then also the thing of like, there was some some piece in there about like, well, if you did, then they would get co opted by American, like 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 uh, Earth culture, and that would not be a good thing. Yeah, it's a great invention, these characters, because they get to come in and really critique Superman from the Kryptonian point of view. And then this is where, like, it kind of tips you off of Morrison's thing of saying that they're like, they're like Scottish Kryptonians, you know, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, a soft wee scientist's son. A soft wee scientist's son. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing him into the moon hard enough to crack the moon. <laughs> I love it. On, uh, on one of the conversations with uh, Kevin Smith, he talked about uh, seeing his mother and his sister fighting at home when they were kids. And the mother would put on a pot of boiling water and like hold it as a weapon. And the girl would have a, a knife, and they would both shout at each other that they'll, I'll fucking kill you, <laughs> and, and just that back and forth and stuff. And and, uh, and uh, Kevin Smith is like, you know, here it would be a, a gun, and and he was like, if guns were in the house in Scotland, like, like one of them would have used the gun and killed the other person emotionally. They, they would have killed each other. He was just illustrating the, yeah. the hardness. You hear it so much with creative people coming out of those kind of conflicts. Like comedians, a lot of them have those stories of Yeah, but it was more about conflict. A, a microcosm of uh, this, just the culture that he grew up in. Holistic, like in the whole neighborhood. So they staple the moon back together, and their staples are these like bridges of the world. This is really neat. It reminds me like Venice will have these, literally they call them staples, but they're like big iron things plugged into the houses to shore up foundations and things as those buildings shift. And this is exactly the kind of like model, what it looks like sutures, you know, on the moon. I, I, maybe we passed it, but there was like a commentary on Kryptonian culture, that Kryptonian cult, it's cultural colonialism too. And Kryptonian culture has sort of taken over. And so now, oh, here it is. Yes. Yeah, next yeah. page, putting underwear on outside of your clothes is, is the fashion trend. After two whole months of listening to them talk about how amazing life on Krypton was, I finally caved in. <laughs> And we see Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, a trend follower. The, yeah. the underwear on the outside of the pants, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got the bad haircut of the day, so of course he would uh, adopt adopt those fashions and have his, like, Tucker Carlson crossfire fucking uh, <laughs> bow tie. Very much cutting promos, I feel like, on that whole concept of superhero clothing. Or just or just trying to have it make sense in mm -hmm. this modern day. Uh, you know, you can you think of a better way to explain these red draws on the outside of Homeboy's gear? 
That's funny. And so we're getting deeper into the sort of Steve Lombard thing. And Clark Kent, you know, he's taking pot shots at Clark Kent and Clark Kent does things his way too. He burns the top of, he burns his toupee and we don't see the ray, which most, most, most of the time we don't see the heat ray mm-hmm. in these things, but... It's such a great comedic character moment, mm-hmm. and 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 the the physical salesmanship of Clark Kent is is the best that's ever been done. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, making that change work that people would believe they're two different. And people. he showed it. Maybe even in this book, there's a sketch this the sketch stuff where it shows how Quietly sees like the Clark Kent posture, and then the Superman, and it's like one drawing, and you just stand him up straight, just mm-hmm. just just lift his fucking head up, and it's Superman, and then. Give him the cartoonist hunch. That might be the best part of like the original Superman movie. You see Christopher Reeve do that just with his face in that one scene where he turns from Superman to Clark with his face. Yeah, it's really impressive stuff. And now our uh, Krypton astronauts are back and basically calling out Clark Kent as Superman. It's funny how like the gang kind of seems to be in on it as mm-hmm. this book progresses. Mm-hmm. But don't give it away yet. The, the narcissist fella is like, what are you talking about? I'm not Superman. You know, yeah, I right, used to have yeah, this great right. yeah. <laughs> He really looks like Sergeant Slaughter in this one panel right here, by the way. Yeah, it's good stuff. I like the uh, flight idea where they're just, just hanging, hanging out. There. Yeah. And so, like Superman through this whole series, they're dying too. And basically, like, every mineral in their body is kryptonite. Like, the thing of kryptonite passing through this cloud that turns it toxic. Yeah, they that got, happened they got poisoned. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of, uh, again, like a great issue for Superman characterization, whether he's burning the toupee as a subtle, uh, mm-hmm. you know, response or responding to them with kindness and, and mercy. Mm-hmm. Quietly is amazingly restrained in his approach when it comes to like backgrounds and stuff. We, we know he can do the Jeff Darrow type backgrounds. We, he, he does it, but he allows so much error and, and the characters are really the important thing. And... There's no black on the shadow. Like, he just... He, he's very singular. The dude's about to get pregnant. He's about to get made pregnant. There's even good stuff here of the two astronauts as they're, like, they're losing vision and things. Mm-hmm. Like, as they're dying, just trying to kind of maintain that connection. It sells the, the goodness of, of Superman because this entire the issue, he, he was getting nothing but dissed. But he's going to be helpful to to the end to these people. I think it also is a parallel of the Superman Lois Lane mm-hmm. story once mm-hmm. again, and it's like another way to show that story. And even doing that, you son of a bitch, hand grabber. <laughs> yeah, it, and they opt to go into the Phantom Zone. It's it's a meditation on death, you know, like like facing death right now. And yeah, his his sort of gift to them is is the Phantom Zone, where we've seen so many Kryptonians sort of live on as a result of the Phantom Zone. Yeah, interesting. As they're dying, he finds a way to save their life, something and that he is probably not going to be afforded. This is their version of heaven, because they get put in a universe full of criminals whose skulls they get to crack right. throughout eternity. Yeah, it's very, very Rick, Rick Veach ish. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Very Max Immortal, because now they're the policemen of the Phantom Zone. And... It's funny, too. Their expressions show that. Yeah. They went from they're dying and it. sad to like, oh. We get to kick some ass. I mean, he's cracking his knuckles, man. <laughs> so heading into issue number 10 here. And uh, the story here, never ending. Um, possibly my favorite issue of this run. This, Yeah, this is the best issue of the run. We talked to Bob Shrek about this series at uh, Heroes Con a bunch of years ago. And, you know, basically told him the same thing, that this is the best best issue of the series. And there's a page in here... That, like, DC hated this issue. He had to fight to get this issue passed and had to fight to get, like, a particular page, like, the best page of the issue passed. Excellent. Here we have Superman. This reminds me of Astro City number one, if you guys ever read it. I think that Superman analog was Samaritan. Samaritan, And they show him being, like, so busy. You know, like, he's Mm -hmm. just, he never gets any downtime because it's, the entire world has problems all the time. And you're kind of getting a little bit of that, of, like, Superman trying to get his business in order, you know, writing his memoirs, essentially, Mm -hmm. in these scenes, but also visiting with sick children, just doing a whole litany of things that Superman does. Do you think this was an edit? Do you think he's holding something? Like, am I missing something with this piece right here? Well, he's looking at his body on a molecular level. He's looking at his cells uh, disintegrating, you know, on a, a, like, a, a microscopic level, so... 
that's like what he's he's not you know he's looking at his face he's like um, um, yeah we're not on. seeing it yeah I guess uh, as an Italian this is a very natural <laughs> pose to me <laughs> It is a weird sequence, you know, like you get a full splash page of him contemplating his last will and testament, mm -hmm. but, you know, not a lot going on here. Like you could do this in a caption, but also like there's no stakes. Like, I mean, you just had to tell me what I saw, but right. but if it's a tooth or something or, mm -hmm. or you know, a, ch a chunk of hair, like, you know, the first missing hair of like a chemo patient hair, or hair something. Hair would have been a pretty, pretty strong the spit piece. curl. I mean, yeah. like, but it pays off because we do get to see molecular level stuff going on. Beautiful. I mean, I've never seen the Bottle City of Candor depicted this well. And making Superman's face sort of like uh, the baby in Teletubbies or something. Like this. <laughs> He's like, a straight up deity. I was thinking the god in uh, uh, the Inkle. It's another example of Quietly being great at scale. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that panel. I think it's super effective. And then you wonder what the original art looks like. Is it the simple th thin line of this? Except it gets fuzzed out by Jamie Rich. There's Is a couple. It's uh, Jamie Grant. There's Jamie a couple Grant. of these um, blur effects, and it's another one where I think, like, okay, this is, you know, like, you're seeing and work out ideas of, like, what do we do with this art? What digital tool, what can digital tools do now, and how can we apply that? Here, I think it works really well, um, but not everywhere that, that some of that stuff works. You know, it's kind of a, I think it's a new technique. You and know, it's really playing with some of these tools that weren't around for the history of comics. Leo Quintum dressed as Flame Bird, Jimmy Olsen's superhero alter ego when he has adventures with uh, Superman's Nightwing in the Bottle City of Candor. Wow. <laughs> that's, what, that's why we need you here, Tom. <laughs> Welcome, Tom. <laughs> you know, it, it, what's funny is this, reading this has inspired me to like uh, go back and check out the old Batmans and, and the old uh, Superman books and just see how they build that mythology. It's just that so much of it is so bad. It's, like, it's horrible like, like, shit. Like, it's impossible to read one yeah. after the other because it's, it's always the same, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it's always the, the kind of... Back the, to the, square the one. The same story. The status quo. Well, this works like this. Yeah. Enrich that stuff. Because that stuff is shit. It's still shit. Yeah. But you read something like this and then you go back and see, like, the story where Superman's got his head... Right. Hit, and it... It makes it a better experience. So that's the that interesting thing. Like those old comics, it's like, yeah, you know, some stuff gets across and becomes canon, like the Bottle City, and then you revisit mm -hmm. that. But it's almost like in spite of itself mm -hmm. that these new little wings develop in things. And when they put out, I don't know if there's a Superman analog to this, man, but when uh, Morrison was doing his Batman stuff, they put out something called, uh, something like the Black Case Book. Mm hmm it, that that's just all kinds of like golden age and silver age stories that are the things yeah, that right. that inspires him. Pulled yeah. from. I don't know if there's a Superman analog, but but that would probably be a good place to start. Right. Yeah. This is a neat concept, and it runs again through the series. Is this idea of how smart Superman is? Like he has built a model universe, a universe. to study the world without him. And this is part of Morrison's mythology. If you read his other DC comics, it's this like cube world miniature that sometimes the justice league and stuff go into and there's no it's a world with no superheroes it's just like their world but no right. superheroes yeah it's 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 kind of a clever piece um cut back to real world stuff and what has happened there's a time capsule from the future and giant footprints <laughs> so bizarre and uh here we go with who's making those giant footprints can introduce giant footprints and not show us the giant and of course it has lois lane in its midst a little superhero fun Yes. And a guy with Alzheimer's is who's piloting this giant robot. You know, like, imagine... That's a disturbing concept. It is. As somebody I mean, with some aging relatives that are struggling with that. Well, just just also, like, the any ability to, like, do do evil. Like, like imagine... You know, it's it's a thing... The exact thing, same thing is scary to me, like, when you were a kid going through school and, like, hitting puberty, and you had, like, a very immature boy who's strong as fuck. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, this is an intellectual version of that word. You know, this is your Vern Gagne, who's still going through the motions of being an old supervillain, but, you know, he's lost his marble, so he's even more dangerous now. Well, who's going to tell Grandpa that he's not allowed to drive anymore? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great analogy. <laughs> And Lois Lane, in the middle of this stuff, why? Because she wanted to get some time to talk to Superman. And, and this goes back to, Ed, what you said earlier about maybe he's not handling that part of it too well. Yeah, and, and it's that great thing. I, oh, man, what was it? Was it uh, 
the newsroom or Breaking Bad or something where they're talk they were talking about you know Albert Einstein he fought with his wife uh, even that guy couldn't figure out women like yay Superman but he's still all thumbs when it comes to emotional intelligence and responsibility. Also, I think you get a little Christopher Reeve Superman on that page. In that second panel, for sure. Because, mm -hmm. like, compare that Superman with this Superman. Mm -hmm. Much more regal. Love this thought, too. As she spoke, I watched 35,000 dead skin cells scatter like confetti, yeah, like promises, like the dust of dead stars. Good stuff. I mean, don't you relate to this story I of do. like making comics and like, oh shit, I got, I got to get this, you know, the this, this schedule. And then just in terms of your life, how many more comics do I have in me? And, you know, this is <laughs> the panic. I got, I got, I got two nights of sleep uh, this yeah. past week and, and, you know, little <laughs> bits of scattered sleep the rest. This is um, one of those effects I was talking about where we saw the blurring earlier of Superman looking through the glass city. Um, here, I guess the emphasis is on what he's hearing, right? So the ear is in focus, but then the edges are not, including mm -hmm. Lois's hand. And I think the effect is a little, it's not as effective. The, th the thing is, by blurring that hand and chubbing it up, it looks like Lex Luthor's hand. <laughs> but one of the things that we're overhearing is... Boy. Superman saves this runaway train, right? The track's messed up and he saves it. And one of the characters is on the phone talking to somebody that, like, I've gotten sidetracked, but I'm going to be there. Don't put the phone down. Trying to stay on the line. Hard to tell who was on the other end of the phone. Could be somebody at home, somebody, maybe it's a date. We find out who it is. It's a patient. It's a psychiatrist and their patient or a psychologist and their patient. Straight out of Jupiter's legacy. And Superman showing up there. I thought that was a really great Superman scene of, of talking this person off the ledge, literally. That's a standout one. That's one like people pull and show like in isolation. This Rightfully page. so, because it's done with one page and like one or two panels before this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Tommy, uh, did, did we get to the page that DC fought over? We're not, we're not there yet. You'll know it when you see it. And um, also part of this, we have all these different types of Kryptonians. And so Morrison wanted to take like, oh, let's get some John Byrne Kryptonians. Let's get some... Or Weisinger Kryptonians, yeah. and then put them all together as if like these are different cultures within. These are different like regions, different uh, you know Krypton heritages. That's and... really nice. Yeah, I love I love how this is going to play out. And then you got the hardcore giant <laughs> comics. Yeah, these are the. Or uh... no, that's Harbinger. You got Harbinger <laughs> in the mix. <laughs> and and they're here because Superman's life's in jeopardy, and they're going to do what they can to try to save that. Yeah, I forget what they're called, like Superman's backup squad or whatever. But they're they're out of the comics too. They're they're an old thing. And here's that payoff of looking at his hand and seeing the molecular level that you mentioned, mm -hmm. like that effect. Pretty good uh, comic book visual language there. Mm -hmm. And we're getting interspersed these flashes to that microscopic world he created and looks like some sort of alien parallel world we're seeing things that don't look too but it's like if if you know the references he's making this is all stuff that happened here this is earth history it's it makes me think about scott mcleod's panel to panel connection on a page like this right because we are crossing some amazing gaps you know the, these gutters Hundreds of miles between these gutters, crossing universes, and it's one panel for mm -hmm. each of those moments. Pretty seamless, too, as you read down that page. It's, it's that marriage of words and pictures, and then the things, the context of what came before and what comes after. If this was going to be just a silent comic, you could, I think you could still do this, but you would need several more pages to kick in the pattern recognition part of your brain to understand the connection. And Superman goes to visit our Hannibal Lecter, mm -hmm. uh, Lex Luthor, behind this this glass enclosure, his prison cell, who is scheduled to be executed. We get some foreshadowing. I didn't catch it until literally four seconds ago. Mixing the perfect cocktail. <laughs> so we'll come back to that one in a few pages. But I love this moment of like, mm -hmm. Luthor hates Superman on a level that I'm not sure I hate anything. I know, right? And, yeah, like, like it, spitting on that glass is in it's love. great space. He he, he off, Superman offers him a hand. It's like, I can fix all of this. I can give you an, another chance or whatever. And he doesn't want anything to do with that. He spits it. And then it slides down. Very gross. Very sexual. Uh, just like when we talked about Dark Knight Returns. Uh, you know, Lex Luthor's hatred of Superman is sexual and so and it's it spit just like how the way superman the way batman spit on the joker's face uh lex luther's spitting at superman and it's sliding you're very aware 
of the viscosity and, and of, of this uh, fluid that's sl sliding around. Nice visual contrast, too, between Superman's beautiful head of hair and Lex Luthor's bald head as they're staring each other down. Like, these are really sides of a coin. Well, this is a mirror also, uh, because Lex Luthor's another vision of Superman also. He's yeah, almost extreme. Superman. And uh, Siegel and Schuster's earliest Superman, the ultra humanite, w was this guy like when they made a superman story before superman it was a bald mad scientist and he and he was the superman of that story it's a good sequence like like most of these scenes makes me wonder about the editing process of this because i have read so much about frank miller cutting down scripts and cutting mm -hmm. things out of stories that might be a good scene it feels like there's so many ideas here and they're really trimmed down to where like a lot of them are in one panel you get a whole page like that's that's a big scene in this in this book And yeah, we're seeing more stuff in that world. And it's getting more familiar, you know, it's, as it gets closer to, to our time. What is, what is this piece? I don't know what this character, like... Well, he's, ta he's talking to, like, the, you know, the Superman of, like, the 30th century. Or yeah, whatever so, so, okay. like. yeah, so, like, the Clark Kent name would, like, have, like, a four where the A is and stuff like that. So, so like, that's future Kryptonian gotcha. speak. And Morrison, in you know, before he ever did this comic, he fleshes out this cos cosmology that we kind of touch on here and there of like what's happening three thousand years in the future. What's you know? Again, you don't need to know any of that to read this. And the plan is to um, basically send that Candor city to Mars, where they can be free and the gravity lines up better and. Again, don't, a lot of ideas there. Yeah, yeah. Don't got to worry yeah. about the the influence of Earth culture. And we get um, the Superman. We get uh, Also Sprach Zarustra. Uh, we, <laughs> right, right. You know, we get Friedrich <laughs> Nietzsche creating the Superman. And in this parallel unit, in this alternate universe, Superman is the creator of this universe, and so he's sort of seeded into this universe. And so they're beginning to describe and discern from the world that surrounds them what the nature is of the creator of the universe, and it's Superman. So that's he's describing Superman. That's really fantastic. And again, as a two-page spread, it is so well constructed that we have that panel on this page, and the rest of the page we have Superman basically giving Quintum this is my DNA, this is my genetic information, mm -hmm. uh, which can imply all kinds of future stories, but it's it's sort of like these two different scenes fit together perfectly. You know, as a two-page mm -hmm. spread, I don't know how you would do better. And it's amazing, like, thinking of the reverse engineering to get this world yeah. to this point. You wonder if... Does Morrison have that uh, Alan Moore-esque kind of, like, room mapped out with mm -hmm. threads connecting sure. different, different ones of these ideas? But... We have the team of kryptonite uh, of Krypton's that are trying to repair Superman's cells. Yeah, they're pushing his cells together, stapling his cells together the same way they were stapling the moon together, pushing them together, and even even a bunch of little Superman can only do so much. Right, but they can do something. Yeah. And Superman goes back to the children we saw at the beginning of this issue, and you know what? They can definitely fix their cells and their diseases, and unleashes them on there in one of my favorite panels <laughs> of this book. And the perfect example of foreshortening and Frank Whiteley's ability to do scale is these microscopic supermen come out of him to go repair these ch sick mm -hmm. children. It's an amazing panel. Yeah, I think uh, you cannot have done this in a pre Cintiq. Like, like, you cannot execute this drawing in a pre Cintiq universe. I'm not saying you use the Cintiq for the final piece, but you can draw these characters at a reasonable size and shrink them down to that size so that when you kind of like print it out in blue or whatever and go over it, that you could keep all those proportions very sound and stuff. Like, take a look at any of your old comics and that's how these little figures would have to have been done. But like, this is this is a use of technology, quietly marrying digital and analog uh, process for and sure. And printing processes. This could not have been done on newsprint 30 mm -hmm. years ago. But even the shape wouldn't, you know, if it was silhouette figures, like you couldn't do that silhouette, just fully eyeballing it. I love when these panels happen too, because there's so much storytelling in that, mm -hmm. and it's set up from the previous story, but it's still like the payoff is there visually. 
And even like the gesture, like mm -hmm. think about drawing that. And yeah, this is a takeoff on an old, there's an old Superman comic where a mini Superman flies out of his hand and, and saves the day. And, and, and that's a, that's a, that's a sweet moment. He's giving mm -hmm. you some, some, some good, yeah. wholesome. Well, that's like, what is an actual purpose that superhero stories can have? And you can have this sort of wish fulfillment of like, what if all this horrible stuff that happens, you can at least have the, 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 the warmth of that thought of like what if we could solve all the world's problems you know right it's it's a beautiful sequence and then we go back to the earth that he's created that doesn't have the su superman mm -hmm. and we get to a point in that earth where uh guess what yeah. we are getting a superman yeah and this is the page that bob shrek said dc didn't want that they fought against that he had to fight for because in this page what we're establishing is that this um dc universe is like the first universe and the universe you and I live in is this cube and that the God of our universe isn't, uh, you know, Yahweh or whatever. It's Superman. Superman is the God of our universe. And Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster have intuited somehow just by being part of that organic whole, the existence of God. And they've drawn this, this uh, illuminated manuscript of, of God himself. And so that, that was the big one that, that Shrek had to fight to get. And it's, and it's cool because it is the implication of like Siegel and Schuster and the Golden Age and all that. A great pencil drawing within a comic. We've seen mm -hmm. lots of comics where a creator is drawing comics. <laughs> I feel like that's a really good pencil drawing. <laughs> Jamie forgot to digitally ink uh, this, <laughs> this panel right here, man. <laughs> and it's put on that skew, so like that's yeah. that's more evidence of that Cintiq usage, where you know you draw it straight up, you, you put it on that skew, and and so that you have it accurate. And then I love all the other little construction lines. Yes, yeah, that's mm -hmm. part of what makes that such a great, believable pencil drawing. And uh, sits down to do his final piece here, Superman is Dead by Clark Kent. Yeah. Interesting cover. Mm -hmm. I was looking at this cover, and I was thinking how we talk about, like, a cover today needs to work at postage stamp size. And it's so interesting how this cover reads when it's very, very tiny. Yeah. You know, like your eye goes right to that headline and you have no trouble reading it, even at a very small internet size, uh, you know, thumbnail size. And this is like that Time Magazine headline, God is Dead. Mm -hmm. All right. As we get into the 11th issue, Lex Luthor set to be executed. So fun. This is like you know, horror movie kind of stuff. You yeah. Know? What's the, what's the, uh, Brian James? Shocker. Shocker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like, you know, tell your sister I said hi. Or yeah, insulting the preacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Taunting everybody around him. Given those three panels of dead pregnant pause and then the look up, you know, like like that sells the moment, man, because it's like, oh, my goodness, he's, yeah, he's done. And, oh, nope, he's talking. Makes me think of Marv in Sin City. Yeah, mm -hmm, definitely. And here's the reference to that book he was reading when Superman paid him a visit, The Last Perfect Cocktail. He drank a 24-hour superpower serum. That's such a fun mm -hmm. comic book piece. Yeah, this is superhero comics and this kind of stuff. You know, there's crypto, the the space dog and shit, man. Like, you could you could do that. <laughs> Give my regards to your sister as he fries <laughs> the security guard. This is awesome. The bullets that he's stopping with, like, steel skin where the bullets are just mushrooming whenever they hit. Bouncing off, tearing his clothing, bouncing off his teeth. Little indent in his head as the bullet mm -hmm. falls away. Yeah, this what is a Matrix great piece kind of, of like, the bullets, you yeah. know, being bulletproof. Melting the door as he exits. So much information in one panel. Yeah. Je I, I, yeah, I do think of Jeff Darrow, too. Like, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a thoughtfulness or something yeah. about it. Yeah, thinking out the logic of the moment. You're uh, cleaning the stables, one of the, the 12 labors of Hercules. <clears throat> yeah, and getting his robot uh, helpers mm -hmm. what they're going to have to do to maintain things to continue to watch his intergalactic zoo. <laughs> you, re you really got to hold that hose at very specific <laughs> angles for there not to be unfortunate tangents. <laughs> and there almost is, almost in each panel. Feels actually. like it, yeah. Even the shape of the nozzle. Yep. And Red goo. Sunday. So we heard Superman in previous, well, we read Superman in previous installments working on his last suit or his next suit, and uh, that's what we are getting ready for. And again, the use of color, right? You're going to need red if you're going to try to fight Superman, and that's what you get all around Lex Luthor now. A nice character? Yeah, who he's got this, like, like 
really like we don't want to know anything about their relationship you know kind of relation my mom hates you like i wonder why uh her mom hates him <laughs> and you get to see all the luther suits which is a fun very fun of, uh, canon yeah fun in every way with that uh, i see toys and things like that you know hanging on, on his wall yeah i don't know about a, a lex luther niece character but i do think of like the Savannah family in like the Captain Marvel stuff, you know, how he's got like a daughter, a, a son, yeah, and they all look like him, just maybe with like a bow in their hair or something. <laughs> all right, we are getting ready for our big showdown. She is very close to like uh, like an Ilsa She Wolf of the SS type mm -hmm. of uh, aesthetic and disposition. It's so interesting to see, like, this is a page turn in the comic book where you turn and you see this red sun right. you know, creature invention of uh luther but not so much in the in the graphic novel collection yeah uh, the issues are just broken up with so many ads yeah and uh for for all of the power of the creators i i just don't know that they had any choice in those ad placements yeah it's a wonder with something like the all-star books that that wasn't you yeah. know put the ads in the back or do mm -hmm. something like that yeah real goofy real stupid but at the time it's just another comic book in fact i remember people talking about this comic when it came out as a vanity project. Yeah. Like, it's not part of continuity, so who gives a fuck about any of it? Like, this right. is just... They want they want to, you know, give Grant Morrison some room to, to jerk off, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's around that New 52 time when, like, continuity was such a big uh, concern for so many people. I love... I'm always a sucker for, like, the rallying the troops. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you have to go face this alone, and they're like, we're coming with you. We'll fight by your side. Yeah, these are Superman's apostles. I also find, like, there are moments in this that really feel like... I guess he's referencing everything, but I see Dark Knight panels mm -hmm. where it's like, I think that's a lift from the Dark Knight. And if that's the case, like, it's not an accident. Yeah. I mean, in Volume 1, he's referencing, you know, Death of Superman. <laughs> you know. So the new suit helps him against that red sunlight. Yeah, Solaris, the the tyrant sun who's part of Morrison's mythology. Like, there have already been a bunch of Morrison comics with this guy in the 30th century or whatever. The robots do not fare well. And it doesn't take long for most of them to be wiped out. Mm -hmm. And one of them has a confession that he's uh, the Judas Iscariot of Superman's robot apostles, that he betrayed Superman and, and made all this stuff possible. Right. Yeah, he's kind of going through that, almost asking uh, atonement mm -hmm. is, is what he's given his life here. This is the panel that reminds me of a Dark Knight panel, and it's the one where Superman stops, like, the... Uh, catches like the intergalactic missile mm -hmm. the nuclear missile i don't know that it's there but for some reason that's what it calls to mind um, reading this and then there's an answer panel to that later on in this one the star eater which was uh, i guess in the first half of this series and mm -hmm. i think it's in issue seven so the very beginning of this part of, of the yeah. video uh we see this character superman set that free to like go to whatever dark part of the universe it can live it's come back. Yeah, it's another super dog that's yeah, exactly. coming back home. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then Superman going nuts because that dog sacrificed mm -hmm. its life to save him. This is a weird sequence. So we're in bad traffic. Lois and Jimmy are like, we got to get out of this cab. And then it's almost the aftermath of that. Like this tank shot the cab. Yeah, but, but we don't see that at all. This is also real time. Because it's a disintegrator ray. And a disintegrator ray, you're not going to see... Wee, 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 wee. It's just going to... All of a sudden, your car's not there anymore. And you're just, like, standing in the middle of the street. I, I love the the acting with the with the ha hack. Right. At the thing. Like, that. that's just... That's a cool piece. And when you see something like this... Is there something extra at play... Like a like a Google SketchUp design or something. Well, there was, it seemed like there was a Google SketchUp for the Bizarro world. That that seemed very obviously like digitally generated for to make a cubed, you know, Earth with reversed oceans and things. And I I think there probably is some kind of maybe three D work at play. Yeah, because I, I I mean it's an amazing design. Yeah, the tilt of the wheels is just such a nice touch. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing. No. I, just, I just want to know how to yeah, do it. Right, exactly. We're <laughs> reverse engineering this stuff. Love this panel of, of our star bouncing off the streets. That feels so believable to me and such a cool everything. Like motion being captured in that. You know, mm -hmm. the bounce feels very believable. And, and just like look at that level of thoughtful detail and fuss. Mm -hmm. 
and and then the color the color getting drained out of it and and uh the nuclear explosion the the, the punch the super the uh, super duper man nuclear punch right yeah it's great whenever it's decolored and then this is like uh you know the you know roll away the stone you know kind of the empty tomb kind of like you know we, uh, or or um what is it when like Everybody leaves the earth and just their clothes are left be- the left behind series. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Great posture on Luther's niece. Yeah. Very happy with herself, feeling very confident in her uh, disintegrator tank. She's very at home in a Grant Morrison comic. And this is like sort of like a sunny, happy, happy Grant Morrison comic. So not, you know, kind of an interesting inclusion, you know. Speaking of impossible to draw... These foreshortened flying hands. Amazing. That. It's so hard to the draw body that language, kind of stuff. Foreshortening. Yeah, not have it look insane. And here comes Clark. Mm-hmm. One last uh, hurrah. But still keeping kayfabe. Great end to an issue, right? Mm-hmm. We've got dead Clark Kent and super-powered Lex Luthor shows up. Mm-hmm. In uh, that in that JLA Earth Two, yeah, there's that one big splash with uh, Luther in his classic Luther suit, and his freaking prow is pushed, <laughs> pushed right towards the camera. So it's the biggest cod piece ever. <laughs> All right, the big climax. Here we go. Starting out with Dead Superman talking to his dead father. Yeah, this is hero's journey stuff, like the meeting with the father. A little looser with the pencils there. Little looser, uh, kind of all all around. I wonder if if uh, quite least filling the crunch a bit. Mm-hmm. It's a dream sequence. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna got some license. There. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna pay a little attention. Also, wonder if it's um, getting more comfortable with what the Jamie Grant colors and digital inking are doing, and even Jamie Grant may be changing a little bit because they don't seem as pronounced the line work. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe not bumping the levels up all the way to black ink like lines. It's hard to tell because visually those are. It's kind of experimental what they're doing. And that was like kind of a quick reference to, uh, for the man who has everything, that it's like he's ima- in his death throes or whatever, he's imagining this other universe where he never left Krypton and there's his dad and, and he's he's Jor-El, he's not super, I mean, he's Kal-El, he's not Superman and he's going to meet his dad and go for a ride in the car and stuff. And you know. Yeah, it feels like a very Western fantasy of, uh, you know, like a heaven, a post a post-death kind of thing, being reunited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he could be there. He could choose to be there with his dad, or he could choose to come back and settle the unfinished business. So that's your Joseph Campbell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Lex Luthor not happy with the way the Daily Planet has covered him. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like once Superman's done, you'd have bigger fish to fry than the local newspaper. Propaganda's important, man. He's a businessman also, dude. You got to promo your stuff. They set that up in the first issue, though, that it was the Daily Planet that put him away. That, gotcha. You know. Yeah, we're definitely seeing lots of different pencil marks. You know, like stuff like that we haven't seen at all. It's 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 more attention paid to uh, lighting. This waterfall is flowing from the gold volcano of Krypton that, that spews gold, molten gold instead of lava. And snaps back to life. Why? Lois. A dude with that Jimmy Olsen haircut would never throw a punch in his whole life. If he did, it would probably be about that effective. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Like we're a bunch of MMA fighters here. (laughs) By the way, I'd probably be in the Jimmy Olsen punch-throwing camp. (laughs) But Kent comes back one more time. Not going to leave these uh, Lex Luthor unfinished thread. And a gravity gun. Gravity gun. Hmm. Interesting choice. Gravity gun. And then this was one of those panels that popped to me where it was like, oh, the color. You know, it's a reminder. We haven't seen Superman in the Superman costume now for an issue and a half. How much that red, yellow, blue pops. Yeah. And and the thing of, of, you know, oh, Superman, we figured it was you dressed up as Clark Kent. Uh, and, uh, you know, here, we have keep this spare suit around. Yeah, right. And Clark's safe, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. It, it feels like everybody's in on the Clark Kent identity <laughs> at this point. A bunch of investigative journalists. Like, if you're going to fool people, that would probably be a tougher crowd to fool than the average Joe. When we were talking to Jaime Hernandez, I think it's on, I think it's on the shoot interview. And we were talking about old wrestling and uh, how he was talking about 
kayfabe and how pe- civilians outside would be like, why are you going to wrestling? Ain't that stuff fake? Ain't that, that, that? And like he did this body gesture where he throws his hands up, like, I don't know, crosses his arms. And then he, on the, in the conversation, I, don't, I hope it's on the record, he uh, did that turn key thing with the mouth and throws away <laughs> the key. Just yeah. said, like, like, that's everybody at the Daily Planet. Right. They're keeping kayfabe. Yes. Yeah, well said. And, you know, the contrast between the primary colors and our secondary colors on Luther, Mm -hmm. pretty clear on this spread. Man, does our driver get mangled. (laughs) That dude's not walking away from that I feel like there's a scene like that in the newest, like, Mark Millar, uh, Frank Quitely comic. And there's a very abstract idea that we're going to get here in terms of this gravity gun and the Mm 24-hour super power cycle that Lex Luthor has created for himself. Now, the, the ground has been laid for that, though, because we've talked about the underverse in the story, talked about, you know, th- as things get heavier, it affects time and blah, blah. So it's not like it's out of nowhere. No, and that underverse, this is the exact same visual for it. It's just that's a street that's now crumbling under the weight, but that's the exact same, like, spiral mm-hmm. version that we saw in the underverse model. And Super- Superman's hiding behind a lead safe, and Lu- Luther points out that. Okay, yeah, I can't see through lead, but I can melt it in a second. So, again, like, picking apart the Superman mythology. Right. This is the other piece that I said reminds me of the Dark Knight. Whenever that bomb is is detonated and Superman kind of almost dies in the Dark Knight, I feel like that's the pose that we see him in whenever he's, like, shriveled up. I don't know that it's exact, but it's what it reminded, called to mind when I was reading this this week. And Luther looks like he's, he's doing pretty well. But something isn't right. Yeah, you see the cape fluttering, standing up. All his powers are gone. What happened? And he's getting, as his powers are slipping away, he's getting these sort of cosmic insights that go with having super sight, super hearing, uh, you know, lightning fast cognition. You know. Yeah, super connected to everything. But it's this idea of Einstein failed to unify the gravitational force with the other three. Those other three, including time. And that's what that gravitational gun has done, has accelerated that time. And yeah, thought is the thing that is, is the force that unifies all thought, all forces. You know, part of, uh, you know, Morrison's, you know, kind of philosophy kind of stuff. The stuff he says with a straight face <laughs> in front of an audience. The stuff, man, uh, half the damn Kevin Smith conversation that Kevin Smith was eating up about seeing beings and shit. And the very last piece that Superman has to do is repair the sun, which was damaged in that very initial Lex Luthor ploy to overexpose him to sunlight. Yeah, he poisoned the sun. And I love you, Superman. That's uh, Grant Morrison speaking (laughs) there. (laughs) And Kevin Smith probably crying. (laughs) (laughs) He does cry several times in the uh, Grant Morrison conversation. Not too surprised by that. (laughs) Um, another one of those, how do you draw Superman flying in these kind of ways that are meant to signify greatness? It's, it's really forceful. It's the mo- like we've seen him fly a million times in, in this v- very comic, and that looks like he is moving forward with such acceleration. Yeah, he's starting to get that like re-entry kind of where where you know it starts to burn up from the friction. Left his cape behind mm-hmm. in Lois's hands as he goes, and here we are a year later at the Superman memorial service. I guess enough time has passed that the world believes Superman's gone. Um, A belief that Lois Lane does not share. And this is that opening panel of whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, where it's like a stone statue of Superman. It's a different pose in that one. This is like one of those old Superman comics, like one of the The first issues where he's got like the eagle, you know. Yeah, some of that propaganda. I love this idea of Lois Lane growing old and just believing that he'll be back. And then, yeah, we get, like, the the origins of the kind of iconography of Superman, this sort of, like, I don't know, what year, like, 1930s or something. But, like, you see, like, murals like this at, like, the Carnegie Museum and stuff up of, like, workers and big gears and, you know. And this is the artificial heart that he's created to keep the sun going, but he needs to man it for, I don't know, like, 3,000 years or something. (laughs) And so he, you know, the, the Arthur is dead but he will return, you know, the, the king will return one day. 
and the great ending here. What a great ending. The yeah. Superman logo with a two instead of an S in the, in the logo. That might have been like the first, th- like, I, I, I don't know if it's, it's Morrison or Quitely who can't, but I picture Morrison starting with that doodle of like the S as a two, you know. Do you know, was there ever talk of doing another, a sequel to this? Yeah, I, mean, I, I never heard any of it. I mean, to me, this is like, you put your sequel in your comic. Like you have, like this implies, like the sequel's in your head now, you know, like like in the last page. And I've, and I've used that trick myself. And um, I mean, yeah, I, I haven't heard any talk of a, of a sequel or a follow-up. This, what, this did come out of a pitch that Morrison and a couple other writers were working on of like a way to reinvent like the regular Superman, like uh, for today, like it was, it was called Superman 2000, I think, like, you know, back when 2000 would have been like the year. So, you know, it was intended to be much larger than 12 issues, but this is, this is what we get. That's interesting. Does Morrison cite those other writers as contributing ideas to this? Um, not as far as I, I mean, I think he just kind of took his bag of tricks and brought it to here. Just like, um, you know, Miller taking his bag of tricks that he was working on with, uh, Steve Gerber when they were going to do the same thing. Like they were going to reinvent the regular Superman comic. And then he just took that to, to Dark Knight Returns. Man, what a story. It is 12 issues really kind of... I, I had to think about, like, Watchmen comes mm-hmm. to mind, as that idea is knowing it's finite and how much you're packing in there. I don't know how many other 12-issue series you would point at, and especially with the idea of, like, pretty tight writing, where yeah. they, they do fit together and are definitely more of a whole than the individual issues. But what a statement on Superman. Yeah, the Watchmen connection, so intentional. And then, yeah, finding, like, the perfect artistic collaborator. Like, who you couldn't do this with anybody else, same as, you know, Gibbons and Moore. Yeah, seems like uh, a controversial superhero artist, too, which always surprises me, but... Quitely, yeah, yeah, I, I I, mean, I don't I don't get the critiques either. Like, he sort of stood out as like, whoa, this guy's the best, you know? But, uh, but no, yeah, he's, you know... Well, there's your Superman story, guys, if you want to read one at home. <laughs> Good to go. I am. Kayfabers like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July is the last Saturday in July, and we are filling the free little lending libraries in our neighborhoods full of comics. Uh, if you got doubles of All Star Superman, put that thing into a uh, free little lending library and create a new comic reader. Yeah, blow somebody's mind. It's our initiative to. Uh, create comic book awareness, man, to people who might not have read a comic book ever. Uh, the Patreon is there for the King Kayfabers to get the videos before anybody else mitigates the Kayfabe effect, uh, which makes, uh, gives them first dibs on the comics that we talk about in the aftermarket, and it gets very pricey sometimes. Uh, ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make, so Jimmy, let the people know what you have going on. Hulk Grand Design and the Plain Janes are available wherever you buy books. My next comic release will be Street Angel Princess of Poverty out later this year from Image Comics. It is the other half of Street Angel Deadly Scroll Live. Together, these two books collect all of my Street Angel comics. They'll look great as a set on your bookshelf. And Image just reissued Deadly Scroll Live in case you missed that. Pick that one up while you're waiting for Princess of Poverty. True Crime Funnies is my latest self published comic book, three nonfiction stories. Um, You guys have bought all of the uh, first printing of this, so I am out of hard copies, but you can download PDFs on my website or on patreon.com slash jimrug where I serialized all of these comics and will continue to serialize my new comics. Tom, let the people know. I have I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee coming soon from 10 Speed Press. Uh, There's also going to be a softcover edition of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And then from Image Comics, I have Jack Kirby's Star Warriors starring Adam Starr and the Solar Legion. It's an old, lost Jack Kirby classic from 1940, the first comic that he signed as Jack Kirby, and I've done sort of like an archival reconstruction of it for a modern audience. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming to you uh, this holiday season, collecting the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree, 504-page book, 140 pages of all new material, uh, is going to be in there, so uh, make sure you support this this comic. It's the best thing I ever made. We showed off some proofs uh, recently. Uh, that is not the only holiday effort that is coming out. Uh, X-Men Grand Design Trilogy is going to be collected into a trade paperback of uh, this holiday season. Some of those volumes are out of print, so make sure you get your hands on that. The latest concern is uh, Red Room.
Crypto Killers is the latest season of comics. Two issues out on the stands right now as of this recording. The third issue is going to have a backup feature that is uh, going to introduce you to a version of uh, the characters that I'm uh, um, playing around with in my daily strips that I'm going to be serializing on my Patreon very soon. Uh, that is not the only way to support these books. Uh, the, that is not the only way to support this channel. There are other ways. So, Jimmy... Enlighten the people. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. Oh, great ways to support the channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Read more comics.